one. All right, welcome back. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Another exciting episode uh, of Aaron's Opinion, of course. So, Jerry Wood, before we really dig into the whole, you know, concept of horror films and all of the terrifyingly fascinating things that you have done, are doing, and will do in film, in the film industry, we need to figure out who you are. So, before we forget, who is Jerry Wood? And as you answer the question and talk about your life and the various projects, I'll help you out along the way. But that would be the first thing to know. Who is Jerry Wood? Excellent. Well, thank you uh, for having me on the show. Always uh, welcome. Here. First podcast, so uh, really? you know, being on somebody else's, so this is this is intriguing. Uh, to define Jerry Wood, uh, simply uh, put, in the short answer would be. Uh, has a, a regular bill paying job and does uh, is an independent filmmaker and freelance photographer on the side. So, you know, have a regular day job to pay the bills and then have the creative work uh, when I can make time for it. And uh, as projects makes themselves available to me. Interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, you know, to dive back uh, a little bit, my dad was a huge movie buff. Um, stories of my grandmother having to go get him from the local theater that you pay 25 cents and stay all day. And my grandmother had to go get him and drag him home. You know, that's how much of a movie buff he was. So, of course, I grew up in a household where the, you know, the dad was the opposite of most people's dad. It wasn't telling us to turn the music down. Uh, he was the one playing it really loud and um, the movies had to be cinematic. You know, we had all the speakers and, you know, big big screen TVs and things like that. So I grew up in that world, not realizing that one day I might actually delve into filmmaking as, as a hobby. <clears throat> and it was around uh, when I turned 30, I uh, went to a filmmaking seminar in Boston called uh, Guy Magar's uh, Action Cut Directed By. Um, gave me a taste for how simple it could be, you know, video cameras were, you know, fairly inexpensive and that was his thing was just go get a camera, uh, spend, uh, a few minutes writing a, a one minute script and then film it and then move on to a five minute script and so on and so forth. Um, so it really inspired me to go out and start doing it. I look for people in my area that maybe have a club or something. I ended up joining Burlington filmmakers and doing a lot of projects with my friend Davey. Um, we did all kinds of shorts. We helped other people with their feature films, you know, nothing that you know really went anywhere or did anything but it was just our way of practicing and honing our craft from there um uh you know we did a lot of projects and then eventually i, I kind of davy i think uh, moved away and i decided to create zen and chaos studios uh, which i intended to write scripts that i would direct and produce uh, maybe build a set for and things like that um, eventually uh, got to doing Where Is She, uh, which was a 46 minute, uh, it's considered a feature because of standards with IMDb and most um, festivals, anything over 45 minutes is considered a feature. So I say feature, but it, it was only 46 minutes long. Um, we actually won four online festival awards. Um, we got picked up for distribution by Ember Films in California. It is available on Amazon Prime, Plex, Tubi, and something else I've never heard of. <laughs> um, and uh, more recently, uh, I've um, helped a couple of guys that I met on the Escape at Danamora miniseries uh, film a trailer for a horror film called Worst Fears. And mm -hmm. we're, we call it a pitch trailer because we were going to kind of package it with the script. And uh, uh, Dave works in L.A. and has a lot of contacts and was going to try to put that in front of um, someone. Someone he knows is going to help us put it in front of producers and see if anybody's interested in optioning it and making the film. Um, that's kind of a, a fast forward uh, to now. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't sure how much detail you wanted me to go into. Very that was beautiful. First. Excellent, yeah. excellent response. So, sure. Oftentimes, when we watch a film, I really think about things through a very interesting lens. 
As a blind person, and I'm sure you're, you're too nervous to ask it, so I'm going to tell you that in case you were wondering, yes, blind people certainly watch movies. And when we do watch a movie, at least speaking for myself, I like a movie with a tremendously powerful dialogue. For me, it's about how well written the script is, how well the prose are written, written the storytelling, you know, if it truly paints a really vivid and powerful picture you know, then it's the type of movie that I'm, I'm going to love. I think it's really interesting how we have this genre of horror because I think it's really an exemplification of our, our day-to-day lives. I mean, our lives right now are basically a horror story that we're survivors of. <laughs> right. So what do you, what can you speak to that? You know, what is a, what impact would you like to have in society and really what are you really trying to help society overcome and do by telling stories in the horror format? And how does all of that work? By the way, of course, I watched the trailer, that pitch trailer that you sent, that YouTube pitch trailer. Yes. I love that, love that story, Worst Fears. I mean, there's so many different twists. We can have a mystery in that. We can have, there's so many different ways that that story can get completely out of control but can be completely believable. So what, what would you say to all of that? Uh, thank you, first of all. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I have an idea for stories in a lot of different genres. I just happen to be, uh, not stuck isn't the right word, I just happen to have the opportunities <clears throat> in front of me uh, to do uh, horror films. And um, I don't know that I have a message for society per se, other than I'm looking to entertain, um, we all need that break from our realities. We all need that opportunity to just, you know, put our problems and ourselves aside and go out and just have fun and be entertained. So I don't, I don't have any political message for anything I do. Um, it's more just like, I have this inspiration or this creative idea and then it gets forged into something that I work until it makes sense to me and then try to make it make sense in, you know, the production. Uh, where's, oh, sorry, uh, backing up to where is she? Sure. Uh, actually, um, I don't know if you've ever um, watched, listened to uh, the, um, it's called a dark comedy, uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil. It's got Alan Tudyk in it. It's it's a hysterical comedy uh, that is filmed like a horror film. And uh, what I was so intrigued with that, that I'm like, you know what? I want to write something like that. So I originally wrote uh, Where Is She as a dark comedy. And then I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to spend all the money, time, and effort to go into doing uh, this project, I really want to go try to go to that next step and really make it just a horror, not necessarily try to make it comical. So I reworked the script. Um, I met uh, um, Dan Flanders, who made the masks for the film. So it's very Halloween in its... um, Uh, presentation there's masks there's candy there's trick-or-treating costumes and things like that and uh, that was you know as far as the statement of uh, to the society was it was just the story that had uh, relevance to Halloween and some other things that I hope the audience would figure out and it's from the responses I've gotten it's everything from the spectrum that someone told me it was too obvious to most people commenting that they had no idea what they just watched and uh so it's intriguing to know that some people got it and went as far as to say it was too obvious and then there's the other spectrum that people just said i didn't get it i have no idea what i just watched so you know um i take all of that as constructive criticisms i learn from my mistakes in the film and try not to repeat them in in other films uh worst fears you specifically mentioned um was a script that dave and darren the couple of uh, guys that i met on the escape of danamora uh, project they had written this script uh contacted me wanted me knew i'd done filmmaking and could be the cinematographer for this wanted to put together this pitch trailer so we dove in so really everything that's about this is really based on a story and characters that they come up with it wasn't 
a whole lot of me uh, adding anything until after uh, we finished the trailer. And then I kind of went through the script and I said, you know what, here's my opinion on certain things. And the guys ended up totally agreeing with me that, you know, it needed a, a, another set of eyes and uh, a little bit of reworking um you know fixing this fixing that according to my opinion and they were pretty much on board with everything and we uh went through made changes reread it you know discussed it again and uh kind of brought it to uh you know final uh draft in order to get it out to uh people so Again, not not really any message for society. Just they had a twisted idea that I I found painting and uh, thought would make a great story. It really intrigued me. It had a lot of levels to it, and um, we really expanded on it uh, and made it. Um, I think something people will identify with in one way or another. Absolutely, absolutely. So. How exactly, if you were to engineer the process, so what are the elements that you would say? What are the elements or ingredients of a masterpiece of horror? What does it really need to have to be like, you know, the number one horror film in, in the country? And what does it really need to have? What, basically, what are the ingredients of horror? How would you draw a recipe? And what do you think those elements are? Yeah, that's a great question. So... I did exactly that. I kind of analyzed, you know, what is a horror movie to me when I was working on Worst Fears and how, or sorry, uh, Where Is She and how I was going to film it. So I went back and, and let me tell you a story. Uh, as a kid, again, my father took me to lots of first run movies in the theater. That was our thing to do. And way back when, when The Howling came out, the very first one, it was the first of its kind, uh, the first with such graphic transformations and just really eerie, creepy sounds. And I remember being, I was only like eight, uh, probably eight or nine years old at that time. <laughs> and uh, I was terrified. I was terrified. I was covering my eyes. I was plugging my ears. My father, you know, basically apologized to me. He's like, I had no idea it was going to be that graphic. And just the sounds of the film really, you know, because obviously I had my eyes covered. So the right. sounds of the film were very. I like, I like where this is. I like where this is going. I like this. Yeah. Movie. And I think that's a lot of it. So that's one, one element is sound. Yeah. And nothing is more terrifying than silence, than yeah. pauses and silence. That's another yeah. thing. Silence is very terrifying. Yeah. So the, the other elements I looked at were <clears throat> uh, visually, how am I going to shoot this? And what is, because we've always, <clears throat> you know, my wife and I are huge horror movie fans. So we'll watch especially during Halloween, we'll go through all of the, you know, Shudder and Netflix. We'll find anything we can that's quote unquote a horror movie and we'll watch it. And, you know, most of the time we're entertained. Very seldom are we, you know, uh, jumping or, or scared or, you know, uh, think we'll have nightmares. But every once in a while we'll come across a, a good uh, a good one and then I analyze it. And I'm like, okay, what made me anxious about this film what made me wonder okay what's going to happen next and and be a little you know overwhelmed by it so for me yeah. sorry go ahead yeah yeah no i was just just as you were saying that i was it was racking my mind um oh i forget what it's called now uh which is Slightly a small blessing in disguise because I try not to name drop, but in this case I can't name drop because I forget what it's <laughs> called. Um, you can you can name drop it if you want. I don't care. You can you can tell me what it's called, and I'll, I'll remember later. The film on Netflix where, oh, I absolutely loved it. Where the card it was a cardiologist working in a hospital. The cardiologist and the um, little boy comes up to him and says, like, all of your patients are going to die and have horrible uh, uh, side effects. And then it turns out that, like, the little boy is, like, cursed and, like, curses the whole hospital. It was an utterly... Oh, interesting. Oh, did, did you, did you watch it, though? 
No, I don't think I've seen that one. I'm definitely going to look for it because that sounds intriguing. Okay, it was, yeah, and just the, the cinematography at the end where they use silence and then, well, I'll let you watch it. But it was just utterly, yeah. you know, utterly fascinating. You know, they, they get a, a child actor um, and there's no way for, well, it's a horror episode here. So there, there's no way for me yeah. not to be not to be creepy <laughs> when I say this. But if you get a, if you get a, a child actor with like a high-pitched voice, it's, Kind of has that raspy child voice and they just say anything the right way. I mean, that can really terrify anyone. So, I mean, that was really, it was one of these films that was just, the writing was so brilliant. And then the the cinematography was so good. It was like, uh, it was like, wow, that's, that's really believable. And that's really concerning. So I think an element for me is, of course, the sound, but then the level of believability you know, like, oh, this could actually happen in real life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, being able to put yourself in that place or fear what is supposed to be feared. I mean, Jaws is a classic, you know. Um, I love That's Steven not, Spielberg. Yeah, it's okay. It's interesting. Do you think, but is Jaws horror, though? I mean, from, like, because I'm 31. So for me, Jaws is kind of, that <laughs> film wouldn't, like, does is that still in the horror genre or is that just like in the adventure genre? Like, w- that's a good question. I don't know what it's actually cl- cl- you know classified as. Well, what do you well what do you put it under? I mean, you're you're an I, expert. What do you put it under? Well, I I would certainly put it under the horror genre because mm-hmm. you know, people die and people get killed. Um, right. You know, it's not somebody with a gun. It's not uh, um, what do you call them? Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 <laughs> I'm blanking now. Um, the the serial killers, you know, it's not, right. you know, or it's not a fantasy horror that, you know, with ghosts or demons or things like that. But I still think it has elements of horror, you know, because you you are put on the edge of your seat. You are wondering when it's going to show up. And because of all the mechanical failures they had with the shark, you never saw it, which is, again, another big uh, thing that I think... Um, uh talented filmmakers do is you know you don't overshow your hand you don't show the monster right away it's always in the back and in the dark or you don't quite see it and that's terrifying because it's the unknown so unknown is definitely um a bit of um i think talent uh talented uh, directors and filmmakers will use is uh keeping things secret um definitely sound for me, it's also the cinematography, what puts me on edge. And I found that certain camera angles, POVs, uh, are, are definitely put me on edge because I'm like, okay, what's going to run in front of the screen? Or or it, it kind of narrows the view. So like if it's a real tight shot on somebody's face, you're just like, okay, now we're claustrophobic because it's real deep, really tight on their face. And I don't know what's going to happen. Is something going to pop over their shoulder? So that's what puts me on edge. So that's what I tried to do in Where Is She is incorporate those things that made me get on edge. And that was one of them, the uh, point of views, um, uh, close up shots, um, just the unknown what's going on here, you know, slow, slow pans or dollies, things like that are all what I think make a great horror film in the ones that I've really appreciated. So good. I definitely agree. Even, even shaking the camera a little bit. If that's a feature, you have to shake the camera, but just enough so that it's noticeable, not enough so that I complain that it's too shaky. Then you have comments below. Stop shaking the camera. What's wrong with your hand? What, you can't hold the camera? You know, you can't have that, but you got to get it. You got to get it just, just a little bit uneasy just to make sure that it's a little bit anxious with the shake. You know, that's, that's another thing that I've noticed. And it's really, when it's done right, see, when it's done right, it's done perfectly. Um, So those would be the types of things that I would, I would really notice, you know, but for me, for me to watch a great horror, it has to also be a storyline that's serious and actually relatable and like firmly believable, you know, uh, very, very believable, you know, Mm -hmm. stories that are too fantasy, too, yeah, too far, there you go, too far-fetched. They're great horror, but they aren't believable. So for me to believe in the horror, there has to be an element of truth. You know, there has to be some reality to make it, you know, all, all the way. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and I um, think that's what we did with Worst Fears. When we worked through the script and uh, we were nitpicking scenes, um, we they they had really come up with some great ideas that I think are are real problems that people face. You know, with what their worst fears uh, of a lie coming, you know, being found out, and you know. Um, trying to stick to what their version of the truth is. And they're all very real stories that could possibly happen to someone. And I think we really played well into that in the script. So um, it, it may not have shown up so much in the trailer because again, you're trying to make this quick thing to entice people. Hey, I want to see this. Uh, we really worked hard on that and I, I, we got some good positive feedback. So I'm excited about that. Now uh, we're just waiting to, like I said, see if someone's interested in making it. And that's another fascinating aspect of this, having stepping to the side of the horror a little bit. How does the process go as far as, you know, you have ideas, I have ideas, we all, anyone, you know, nothing personal. Anyone can have an idea. But what mm -hmm. makes an idea good enough to become a goal and actually get picked up by a company to actually for them to say, okay, this is worth signing people up and actually creating the film. What, where's the, you know, what, what really is the threshold? Do you think? Yeah, that's a good question because I can only surmise from what, you know, I've kind of gleaned from, cause I'm in the independent world. I'm, I'm a relative nobody. Uh, you know, I've done a few things. I've uh, been in a few things, but, uh, you know, nobody's going to know. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's so-and-so. So, and I'm perfectly fine with that. So what I know, uh, Hollywood is looking for in, you know, filmmakers in general, one is probably partly name recognition. If yeah. you can attach somebody to it, that will draw a crowd because people want to see so and so in a film and uh, think they would do well in that type of genre. So, um, but you know, Uh-oh. Um, are you there? <laughs> and, and no names. So, yeah, it, it's hard to say what yeah, every producer's... Sorry, I guess I dropped offline. Yeah, you did. You did. No worries. No sweat. Just... Go back and tell me again. So you aren't quite sure, but something about the name recognition, if you could, um, I think the recording will actually correct that. But just for me, if you can explain it again about the name recognition thing. Yeah, absolutely. So what I think, you know, producers tend to look for or what's going to sell a film. They may, you know, it's hard to know because everybody is different. You, you can hand them a script and they may like it. They may not like it. But if they see a possibility and they're like, you know, uh, I know so-and-so actor and uh, this name will bring a crowd. People will go to the movies and pay to see it in the theater just because this person's name is in it. I mean, we've all done it and, and unfortunately been disappointed sometimes, but I think name recognition, if you can show that uh, someone is interested in your script then a producer might be, okay, I see the merit because now they're seeing it in the, the run. Because obviously everybody wants to make money. Uh, they don't want to make a flop. They, they're putting their reputation and their um, time and energy and uh, resources uh, to the task. So obviously they want it to do well and make money. That's everybody's goal. But um, yeah, how do you intrigue someone I think is subjective. And for me, writing a script, you know, sure, I could think it's all well and good. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it to people that aren't just going to tell me, hey, yeah, no, I loved it. You know, friends that are trying to be supportive. I'm going to get it to someone who's going to tear it apart and be, you know, uh, subjectively um, uh, with their constructive criticism. They're not going to be mean, but they're going to.
up to My apologies again, Aaron. My internet is... No worries. Frank. Uh, um, and uh, keeps dropping us. So tell no me what you heard last. <laughs> well, well, that's... that's Yeah, I mean, I think I... I mean, I think I got... I, I really got your answer there. I think that that's very... A very sensible um, and very, very understandable. Um, so and then and then and then the other thing is um have you ever networked or connected with other independent filmmakers who specialize in horror from other countries have in other words have you seen what other countries pass for horror what passes for horror in other countries I have not directly connected with anyone um, as a filmmaker. I, I have spoken to um, and thought were, was really well done. It is called The Pool. And I'm not going to remember what country it was filmed in uh, or the language. It was it was subtitled, but this is a perfect example. The movie had very little dialogue. What drove the movie and made it intense and the, the it was the anticipation of what was gonna happen. You, it, it was this huge pool. Um, uh, 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 they were draining the pool and the story it's all based on uh how you feel about what you're seeing and the music and you know him narrowly escaping and and you know not escaping because he got almost there and and uh, you know fell back in or something broke or you know and and it's just it was really wild uh i i highly re recommend it i, I it's Sure. Are you still here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I I would say if you want, you can turn off your camera if you would like. That might help it a, a little bit. Um, but of course, um, another question that I have for you is so oftentimes, you know, in talking about something totally different. Whoa, hello. Yeah, I would say if you can turn off your, if you can turn off your camera, that might, that might actually be good. Um, oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah, let me do that. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, these, these things happen. Uh, it's really, it's really giving you a hard time. Um, yeah, yeah, what's, what's happening is, um, I thought I had, uh, there, my camera's off. Okay. Uh, We've been having a lot of issues with our internet. I thought I had gotten it reworked, but for some reason, no, no worries. Yeah, that's significant. That's significantly better. So, 
what what I was aiming to ask and what I want to get into next is this whole notion of, you know, if you talk about something totally different from horror, which is comedy, okay, kind of the opposite of horror, we say that comedy and jokes are always at someone else's expense, meaning to make a really funny joke, someone has to be offended a little bit. So really, what have you found... <laughs> What have you found to be the boundaries of the, whoa, don't go there in this horror film that's just, like, what counts as too much and over the edge to you as someone who designs horror? What do you think really is just over the edge for horror? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That would... Uh, Two more. That's just a little. Bit. Um, uh, that's a great example. But, you know, I'm with uh, you know capitations and mutilations and things like that. But I guess I get squeamish when when too gory. Um, mm -hmm. That's not even. I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, uh, um, what's that one? Uh, it's not necessarily a line. It's just it's a matter of what I feel. Um, I, you know, I don't like pandemic. Uh, I, I prefer not to watch pandemic movies because I guess that's just a little too real for me. I'm like, I, I don't want to. And this is even before, you know, COVID and everything, you know. Um, I, I don't like intense uh, uh, mm -hmm. dramas like that. I prefer you know, the classic slashers or uh, something with a, you know, a brain intriguing. Uh, I want it to be a mystery, you know, that you're figuring out while you're, you know, enjoying the horror genre. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to think of more specifically lines crossed. Um, I guess it depends on uh, the human centipede. I'm not sure I really have any interest. My stepdaughters mentioned that and I've, I've heard about it. I think that might for me cross a little bit of a line. I, I don't, I wouldn't want to see that. I just, I'd be too grossed out by it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. What about the, have you known of, or have you been aware of people with disabilities being portrayed in a horror film, doing something horrible in a horror film, still with a disability. Boy, I'm trying to think. I don't think I have seen anything like that. Because that would be that could be a blockbuster. I have sure. tons. Of, I have tons of ideas. I have tons of ideas because, as someone with a disability, I kind of would appreciate that to a certain extent. If you kind of take a matter of disability issue and then kind of not make fun of it, but kind of create a horror around that issue to kind of illustrate the issue. That could be really fascinating. Yeah. Or, or could have a sense of unease or a creepiness to it because you're exposed to this, you know, now the protagonist is, someone you didn't expect uh you know uh, had a disability like you said that you didn't expect um and that could add tension <clears throat> and eased. right absolutely absolutely um now as far as your uh podcasting goes you mentioned it over messenger when we were talking before but it seems like you've kind of slid away from podcasting what can you tell us about your podcast in the past I think my, my Wi-Fi bounced to a different, so, okay, I, I think I'm back now. That's fine. Did you hear my last question? I didn't. It garbled and then it disconnected. Oh, my. Um, oh, okay. You mentioned before about your podcast. Um, have you thought of creating a horror podcast? 
have you thought about getting back into podcasting? Uh, I, I have thought about getting back into podcasting. Uh, the one I had uh, started with my uh, one of my oldest friends uh, was just an opportunity to practice and kind of uh, work out the bugs. Uh, you know, we didn't expect anyone to really follow us, but it was an opportunity to learn what it took to put on a podcast and the ins and outs of, you know, making it available and uploading and editing it and having all of that. So uh, I think I think I learned uh, from that. And it was a great opportunity for my friend Chris and I to reminisce about our stories uh, that we always tell that our friends seem to enjoy uh, from our childhood and uh, about Chris getting me in trouble and then uh, uh, funnily enough uh, subsequently getting me out of that same trouble um, so you know it was a good opportunity to tell those stories and uh, the the next podcast I would like to do and I, I have no timeline for this but I know a lot of people th uh, that do are doing wonderful things uh, um, and I'd like to give them uh, a place to voice more about what they do and you know get it out there further if i had some kind of following obviously this would benefit them more because it would get their story out there a lot of people i know are doing wonderful things uh sleep in heavenly peace uh, bob rosso's uh helping big Okay, I think I'm back. I, I'm sounding like a broken record, but I, I'm really trying to this That's that is that is fine. That is fine. Um, yeah, I mean, all of that, all of that is really good. I think one of the things that you wanted to get into yourself at some point was creating some sort of podcast or platform where you would interview you know, other people, other voices around the community that are less heard and you would still like to give give those people a voice, right? Yeah, that's that is perfect way of saying it. Uh, there's there's so many people doing wonderful things that you know, the community may not know about or uh, just fun things like uh, Rookie's Root Beer uh, is uh, they, they basically brew it and bottle in Canada out of their house. And um, uh, when I've gone to pick some up, I, they had the garage door open and I saw the whole brewing thing. Uh, I love to know that story. What made them do this and, you know, what... What drove her to create the uh, rookie's root beer, and how how did she do it? I just think they'd be fun stories to get out there. And then, um, you know, more personal notes with Josh's house and um, our friend uh, Val Palata putting together a place for veterans to go. Oh yeah, and, I mean, yeah, you know, all all based from her son uh, committing suicide and her wanting to 
help prevent that by building a place for veterans to go where they can socialize, play games and have food and just, you know, uh, learn things. There's, you know, people come in and teach fly, uh, fly fishing, uh, lures they you know show you how to make those you know they can do massage they get massages they can work out you know so it's just there's a lot of wonderful stories out there that i think the community just doesn't know are they make great podcast episodes yeah those definitely could and should and you should definitely you should definitely interview those people because oftentimes the people that we hear about the least or the smallest audiences are the audiences where the people care, you know. So right. those, those are the types of people that you want to interview, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So, um, and what are some other, you know, futuristic projects that you really want to, that you hope to work on? You know, what are some of your, I guess dreams that you would love to be able to do in the future? Yeah, I, I have one that's been on my mind. Uh, my process uh, before I actually start writing is I get an idea and then I kind of just think about it when I have those opportunities. Uh, I do, you know, I go for walks at work for exercise. So you know, I'll play around with it in my head and like, what's, who are the characters and what are they going to do and what's the story based on? And you know, I slowly, it, it slowly evolves to become something and start having some meat to it. And then I'll start writing notes down in my phone so that I have them for future uh, perusal when I'm actually start writing the script. And then I come up with ideas. I'm like, oh, I got to write that down. And this could be one element. So, you know, when I take that process and I've got an idea, I am not sure if I'm going to make it a mini series. Um, I, I feel like I want it to be in three parts. So it could be, you know, three seasons of, a story or the three like a trilogy you know uh having um uh three separate movies that tell the individual stories that i'm looking for um i thought any series it would be cool because i'm always thinking like you know is this something i could film you know versus trying to write it and then sell it and hope somebody makes it and if that doesn't work you know is it geared enough to something i could do and it was kind of partially born during uh, COVID, as I guess a lot of probably story ideas did. And there's a whole bunch of them out there. Host, uh, when we were talking about horror movies, uh, Host is a good one. Friend did. They're all like um, uh, using your cameras on your computers to tell the story. And it was an interesting thing. But that made me think, well, you know what? I could work with a lot of different actors in different places if I did it through that type of filmmaking where part of it was through a computer, through some kind of Zoom, like you and I are talking right now, could be, a, you know, set up dialogue and then have edge parts outside of this, you know, uh, one way of uh, communicating with someone. But I thought it'd be a great opportunity for me to work with other makers in other parts of the country uh, that I've met that could maybe have because they're working on their own thing they have a somebody that could uh, be their cinematographer and director and uh, you know have actors in it and film a piece of my movie because the concept is um there's this private investigator that is working to solve um uh, missing people type crimes and i, I envision calling it uh, abduction uh, that was one of the titles i was working on and that kind of has the dual meaning, you know, uh, abduction, like someone abducted. And there's also the extraterrestrial part of uh, uh, abduction. And I was going to kind of play with that line. And I know everybody's going to first say, well, X-Files. And I did watch X-Files. Uh, I haven't watched the, the most recent stuff. And I do remember watching it back then. But I, I believe my story idea is something uh, entirely different. And obviously, I can't delve into that because then I'd be giving away all the spoilers. But the meat of it is something different. And this private investigator gets teamed up with a um, or agoraphobic person that's a hacker that allows that they work together in such a way that the hacker is able to he's like a super you know 
super hacker can get into just about any person's accounts and can, you know, get into their email, get into their credit card and decipher what they've been doing. And this helps the private investigator find uh, people that are missing because maybe, maybe, you know, it was, uh, you know, the husband, you know, took the child or um, it's going to be more supernatural than that. But that's just uh, uh, where I was going with it is these two are going to team up. Uh, they're going to be looking into these stories and then there's going to be all these other kind of things that I'm going to add into it. So that's why I think it could be a mini series is there's going to be different stories, but they're all going to play off each other. There's going to be elements in each episode of the season that's going to play on the other and you'll eventually see that all come together. So that's what I'm working on in my head. I haven't officially started writing anything, uh, you know, in script form, but that's, I think, going to be one of the next projects I work on and kind of flushing that out and developing it into, uh, like I said, either uh, a series or a um, trilogy of sorts. Mm hmm. Really, really, really good. I mean, all of that is is truly fascinating. What are some of your other um, hobbies that you do if, if you aren't if you aren't coming up with disturbing ideas in your mind or if you aren't <laughs> if you aren't pretending to scare yourself by watching horror? Do you, do you ever watch? Have you ever heard of something called like, you know, like watching nature shows or watching sports? Do you ever do? I, I've always you know, we've always wondered in the podcast. Podcasters have been dying to know, gee. Do do people who write horror films do they watch other stuff on TV or is it just are they just stuck in that are they just trapped What do you think about that? No, that's that's a great question, and I, I'm certainly not trapped in it. Uh, the the fun story is uh, I told you a little bit about uh, my dad taking me to see The Howling. Well, that pretty much uh, kept me from watching scary until i was well into my adulthood um you know i i stayed away from it i was afraid of the genre and how i kind of delved into it and you know making uh films and work on projects that deep in what used to terrify me uh there's there's still certain films i can't watch uh, i probably could if i really wanted to but the exorcist that that is like the one mm. that i and it's what it represents because like you said it's all a matter of what you believe and what you think is possible and <laughs> so apparently i really believe that's possible so that terrifies me a little bit um but no i i certainly love comedies um i like a good drama it's not my go-to but if it's well done i i really like dramas. Pretty, oh, sorry, uh, dramas. I, I like pretty much anything in any genre if it's done well. I mean, I'm not into old westerns, uh, but I think quite a few, you know, revised versions of uh, what you would consider a western. Like, a, what is it? Uh, something 310 to Yuma. I thought uh, that was really well done. Um, so yeah, I mean, outside of uh, coming up with ideas for film, I do, I'm an avid, avid photographer. So I go out and, uh, in the summertime, we like to go to concerts, uh, that are playing various, uh, cities have their own way that like Wednesdays is in Essex and Wednesdays is, uh, South Burlington. So we, we kind of follow the musical circuit and see what is out there that we want to listen to and then i'll bring a camera and i'll take pictures i'll post it on facebook and share it with the band uh just also as a calling card like hey this is what i can do if you ever want someone to photograph a concert or um you know film one of your shows uh, you know hey hit me up kind of thing so I, I definitely have a lot of hobbies. I like to be outdoors. We go kayaking. Uh, we like to go to the beach and go swimming and stuff like that. So I certainly get away from the uh, the horror and the and the scary stuff. Right. Absolutely. That's really really fascinating. Um, and I'm I'm still kind. I still kind of have to ask. You know, I sent you a messenger message. I don't know a long time ago, over a year ago. What made you, I mean, I'm so glad you did. I just, I'm just fascinated by it. You know, what made you, uh, what made you pick up your messenger and say, oh, Aaron's opinion or Aaron Richmond sent me a message. That's just kind of fascinating. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. That was totally, you know, I, I really didn't expect you to uh, respond to me. I figured you would assume I blew you off and be like, no. you know, I'm done with this no, no. guy, uh, moving no. on. You know, that's what went through my head. But, you know, basically, you messaged me right at the time that Tupid Talk was kind of going on hiatus. Uh, I had moved, uh, we were planning a move to a new house. So, of course, we're doing a lot of packing, we're doing a lot of renovations at the old house. And, you know, again, the podcast was born from COVID. It was a way for my one of my best friends and I to stay in touch uh, because we couldn't go see each other. So we're like, hey, let's do that podcast we talked about and, uh, you know, gave us a way to kind of, you know, shoot the shit with each other and, mm -hmm. you know, have fun doing it. And reminiscing so uh right when you messaged me i believe was around the time that i had stopped paying attention to tupid talk and i'm like okay we're gonna come back to this i just need to get through the move once we get set house and then of course we get to the new house and there's a bunch of renovations that need to be done to make it our own so we tackled all of that uh moved in the uh 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 winter so um we had some time before spring and our head and i want to get the major products out of the way so that we can actually enjoy our summer so uh i had been away from it long enough that i'm like oh i need to go back and you know look at uh i have a few different pages i have my zen and chaos page um i'm helping with uh, the charity for shp the sleep and heavenly peace i help them so that page and i the way facebook keeps changing things they they change how you you see your your messages so i probably didn't see your message because of other messages and it got scrolled mm -hmm. down through just being busy so i went direct to the page and saw that there was a number one on it and i'm like hmm i wonder what's on my tupid talk page so i went and i looked and i found your message so it was from like a year and a half ago i'm like oh man um so i, I obviously was intrigued uh someone wanted to talk to me about my podcast and uh put me on their show i'd never been on somebody's podcast uh short of like like I said just doing my own so I was intrigued by that at first and um, I listened to one episode of your podcast you were interviewing a woman from Italy I'm not going to remember her name but uh, she was blind as well and I just found the, the interview very intriguing the things you guys talked about um, I liked the back and forth and I, you know, I started, started some of the other ones just to see, you know, the different types of people you were interviewing and the topics and, uh, just thought it would be fun. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to reach out to this, uh, you know, opinion and see if they're still interested or, uh, uh, what they wanted to do. Cool. Great. What are some you know what are some questions that you really want to know as we start to close down close out the hour what are some questions that you really want to know about you know about me in particular you know i always like to say you know jerry if you can ask me only one question to make me sweat uh to really terrify me to really see if i'm worth my salt as a podcaster what do you really want to know about me ah <sighs> That's that's a good one. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one question comes to mind is, you know, and again, I only know so much about your podcast. So what made you uh, start Aaron's opinion? What what was your goal? In, I love it. Uh, I love telling people. Doing. So, well, I've been working as a teacher um, for seven years. Um, and no, you thought you thought I was going to say actually. Um, you don't remember me? I've been an actor in horror films for... for, for... <laughs> no, sorry. Sorry, let me just disappoint you. No, I'm just one of those people in the audience that supports what you do. But no, actually, if truth be told, I, I consider myself to be someone who, who would be an actor in a philosophical sense. And I... I secretly, as you can tell, I secretly would love to be secretly, discreetly involved in the construction of one of these scripts for one of these films. Although probably if you saw some of the dark things that are going on in my mind, you might actually really be more concerned than actually scared. <laughs> um, I love her. But I've been, I was working and still am, thanks to God, working as a teacher, teaching English as a second language for seven years now. But at the time it was about three years ago and it was, 
you know, just right around the the height of the pandemic, and I was listening to other podcasters around the disability community and the blindness community, and I noticed that they, in my opinion, were not open to my perspective on life and my opinions about the world. So I wanted to create an environment where people can come and share their stories and talk about philosophical things around the universe, and that I want to create an environment that truly is the most open podcast that someone could find. And I truly want to help people. And that's what it has become. Mostly I help and have spoken to and interviewed mostly blind people from all over the universe. But sighted people like you are always welcome and continue to be always welcome here. Um, Because there's some really, as you were saying earlier, there's some people doing some really great work. And you would hate, I would hate, we would hate to see them go you know, go to the wayside just because they lose confidence because they don't have enough subscribers, they don't have enough views, they might think, well, nobody cares. Well, actually, I care, you care. You'd be surprised who secretly cares. So that's why podcasting and content creation is important because it's giving people a voice when they might be too afraid to speak up. And that's kind of the whole, you know, raison d'etre, the whole, you know, the whole, the whole reasoning behind it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I I had caught some of that on uh, other podcasts, and and I did know you you did the teaching uh, uh, English as a second language. So that's that's cool. What um, what do you hope to uh, you know? Is obviously everybody hopes to have subscribers. You're, you're looking to help people. Have you ever gotten feedback uh, back from someone that said, "Hey, you know, after listening to your podcast or being on your podcast." Uh, you know, uh, this happened and you, know, you help them. I think in a discreet way, the answer is yes, because I keep getting better and more fascinating people like you who are, <laughs> are just coming up out of the woodwork to talk to me after a couple of years of not talking to me. So <laughs> I, I think that I think that is the magic of this is that it keeps going. Um, another funny one, since we kind of have the same six sets of humor, I had a guy in the community, he was on my show. He wrote, I I, I kid you not, it was like a horror movie. Okay. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, you have to say, I I told him on messenger with my voice. I said, you're killing me. You're killing me. And I'm going to tell you why (laughs) he created a list of a whole bunch of videos. And he says, Aaron, for this video, I really, and he's typing it out. Aaron, I really like the way you gave this opinion. And by the way, in this other video, I like the fact that the guest said this. And did I tell you about this video? I really like the fact that you talked to this person. You're a really good learner. You're a really good teacher. I messaged him back. I said, you're killing me. I'm glad you're sharing that on Messenger. That's the wrong place. You're supposed to take those nice things and put them in the comments where they belong for each corresponding video. How hard is it to comment when you're trying to compliment someone? You're killing me. You're killing me. Come on. It's so funny. It's hysterical. Yeah, exactly. People are just so silly about that. It's like, well, comment. And then as we say on YouTube, well, comment below. No, really. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Wait, hold on. Stop, stop. Comment below, right here. Comment below. <laughs> well, what does comment in, below mean? Nobody. In case, would you just? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that's hysterical. It really, it really, it's really weird. And the other weird thing about commenting below is that most creators, in my opinion, don't respond. But if you at home, if anyone comments on my video, they're going to get a response from me, and that's very important. So. Um, th- what uh, I, I do have one final question for you before we go, which is if you still and only have one fear about your life or society or the world, what is one fear that you still hold true to your heart today? Ah, oh, geez, not, uh, not doing what I think I should be doing. It's a good answer. And we- wasting time on other things because either i'm too afraid to tackle the thing i really want to do um and for me i guess that's writing i started writing at a very young age at, when it was in fourth grade the teacher put four pictures up on the uh board, uh and said okay go ahead pick one of these and just pre-write it. and that's 
so inspired me. I, I don't even remember. I wish I wished I knew if I still had that, which I'm sure I don't. It was probably something we turned into the teacher, never got <laughs> back, uh, or, you know, simply got lost. But that started a bug in me that I started writing these just little stories and I, they were note stories and never really got flushed out into anything. As I grew up, I'm like, well, maybe I'll be a writer someday. And I started writing poetry because it was something a little simpler and a little quick. And uh, again, you know, as life happens and things go on, you're, you go in different directions and it's busy. And I'm like, oh, I get these little opportunities to do some writing. And, you know, oh, well, I got to get here because it was so-and-so's birthday and I wanted to write this little thing. Um, and I got creative with it and I enjoyed it and they liked it. So I'm like, okay, kudos, kudos. Uh, but, you know, still not delving into that writing uh, that I, I have so many ideas in my head, so many stories and books that I'm like, oh, this could be an idea. This could be, you know, as I see some visual with that. So when I'm writing thing or reading things, I, I see it in my mind and I do the same thing when I'm writing. I, I I see it in my mind first, and then I kind of jot it down. So I guess my biggest fear is just not having enough time to write and get to that point where I can be writing and doing something with it, whether it's yeah. selling it or publishing it or whatever. I, that's my biggest fear is I, I feel... Sure. I have an, you know, an, an aptitude for it and that I'm just not using it enough. It's a really, really fascinating, fascinating place to end. If someone wants to get in touch with you, Jerry Wood, how would they go about doing it? Uh, I can be reached. Uh, my website is Zen and Chaos Studios, very simply www dot z a c studios dot com i'm on most of the social medias i'm on Facebook, twitter and instagram uh it's my handle is at zen and chaos um yeah those are those are the best places to reach me thanks so much everybody is going to really enjoy this interview it was a wonderful episode as always keep cre keep creating great horror films i wish you the very best of luck in all of your projects, uh, as I like to say, as I like to say, usually on the audio, but I'll say it here too. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Jerry Wood. You're forever welcome here on Aaron's Opinion. Thanks so much, everyone. Stay safe. And as we like to say, help one person today, help a million people tomorrow.